to a history class with Dr. W and our continuing study of the year 1968. In our previous lectures, we talked about the election process of 1968 and particularly the Democratic Party and the primaries. In this lecture, we'll pick up another story that takes us through the entire year of 1968, that of the continuing civil rights struggle. We'll begin by looking at two events early in the year, the Kerner Commission Report and the Orangeburg Massacre, and then we'll move through one of the most tragic and signature events of the entire year, the assassination of Martin Luther King. On February 8, 1968, at about 10.30 at night, a spate of police gunfire lasting no more than 10 seconds left three young black men dead and 27 others wounded in Orangeburg, South Carolina, on the campus of South Carolina State College. The Orangeburg Massacre is an often overlooked event of early 1968, though historians in recent years have attempted to revive the memory of those who lost, lost their lives, Samuel Hammond, Delano Middleton, and Henry Smith, and the others who were wounded and scarred in this horrible attack. The shooting represented the culmination of two days of activism in the Orangeburg community as African Americans, primarily students at the uh, couple of historically black colleges in the city, attempted to desegregate the local bowling alley and other institutions. But it also represented in some ways the culmination of the movement that I talked about in previous lectures in this class, the civil rights struggle that had been ongoing throughout the 50s and 60s, and as I described in those lectures, had been growing more militant in the years of the middle to late 1960s. The tension started two days before the shooting itself, when a group of local black students decided to attempt to desegregate the local bowling alley. As they entered the bowling alley, the owner of the alley called the police, and a clash erupted between students and policemen, ultimately leaving nine students and one policeman in the hospital at the end of that first clash. Over the following days, local authorities and the governor of the state called in more police and officials to oversee the growing protests as students attempted to desegregate other institutions and simply marched in the streets to protest conditions. On the night of the shooting itself, a fire truck arrived on the scene to put out a bonfire that the students had started. That would have seemed peaceful enough, but the students gathered to the scene and began chanting and yelling as the fire was being put out. Suddenly, one of the officers began firing into the crowd, and students ran for cover up a hill. As one of the survivors, Robert Lee Davis, recalled, he said, the sky lit up. Boom, 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 boom. And students were hollering, yelling and running. I went into a slope near the front end of the campus and I kneeled down. I got up to run and I took one step. That's all I can remember. I got hit in the back. While reports concluded that only eight or nine of the officers on the scene fired and that the shooting lasted no more than 10 seconds, it was still sufficient to kill three of the students and injure 27 others. In the aftermath, blame was placed on the protesters themselves and particularly on a group of so-called black power advocates who had arrived from out of town and, according to the authorities, were stirring up trouble. Chief among them was Cleveland Sellers. A year later, a jury took less than two hours to acquit the nine troopers who were accused in the shooting. And another year after that, Cleveland Sellers was convicted of starting a riot. He had come in from out of town, and according to the jury, he was stirring up trouble in the area. Sellers ultimately served seven months in prison. For years, the story lingered that the trouble lie at the feet of the protesters themselves, and particularly Cleveland Sellers, and the officers themselves were acquitted and blameless. 
Over time, and after much investigation, historians began to correct that historical record. South Carolina typically resisted digging into the truth of what happened in this massacre. But eventually, after the year 2000 and in recent decades, more of the details have come out. The students were not armed and had not initiated an attack upon the soldiers, as some early reports indicated. This was not an exchange of gunfire between the two sides. Only the troopers were firing. And while it was certainly a tense situation on all sides, it was the itchy trigger fingers of some of the soldiers, and particularly the one who fired the first shot and then sparked some of the other firing, that led to the massacre itself. One of the issues that was common during this era is that troops who were sent to the scene of some of the riots and protests were not trained to adequately deal with them. And in the midst of the fear and confusion of many of these situations, oftentimes a shooting like this and violence was the result. On the 35th anniversary of the shooting, South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford said, I think it's appropriate to tell the African-American community in South Carolina that we don't just regret what happened in Orangeburg 35 years ago. We apologize for it. There's much more to be said about this massacre than we have time in the context of these brief lectures. So I encourage those of you who are interested in hearing more to look up one of the two documentaries that I've listed here, Orangeburg 50 Years Later, or Scarred Justice, the Orangeburg Massacre, 1968, both of which are excellent documentaries and provide much more detail than what I've just described. And if you're taking this course with me, the 1968 course, you are required to watch one of these documentaries as I explain in the class itself. The Orangeburg Massacre was representative of the growing tension and racial violence that had spread across the country in the mid to late 1960s, and which I started to address in an earlier lecture in this course. They culminated in the summer of 1967, with major riots in Boston, Buffalo, Cleveland, Wilmington, and many other cities, the worst of which was Newark. Newark was on the brink of a racial breakdown at that time. One of the worst disparities in wealth and opportunity between black and white in the entire country existed there. In July 1967, the arrest of a black taxi driver sparked three days of rioting and clashes between blacks and the police. Over 20 were killed, 1,300 arrested, and the damage totaled more than $10 million. The following week, an even worse riot erupted in Detroit. This was more unexpected, as blacks in Detroit were relatively well off compared to many other cities. The auto industry and others provided many good jobs. This riot was sparked after police arrested a group of blacks at a nightclub that was selling alcohol after hours. Over the next week, thousands of fires raged through the city. Looting was rampant. At times, National Guardsmen fired indiscriminately at blacks running in the streets. Forty-three were killed, and more than a thousand were injured. Liberals typically blamed the rioting on inequalities in the system. As Lyndon Johnson said, As I see it, I've moved the Negro from a D-plus to a C-minus. He's still nowhere. He knows it. That's why he's out on the streets. Hell, I'd be there too. Commissions studying race in the country, and we'll talk about the Kerner Commission in just a moment, called for massive federal assistance programs to improve the plight of the impoverished and the uneducated. But the escalating war in Vietnam sapped Lyndon Johnson's capability to do anything about it. Despite his advocacy of the war on poverty, which I talked about previously, he was never able to approve a significant appropriation to combat it. For every dollar spent on efforts to improve the plight of the urban poor, 50 were spent on the war in Vietnam. Conservatives tended to blame the blacks themselves and other protesters. In this period, they preached the gospel of law and order. Richard Nixon ultimately wins the presidential election in 1968. 
as the so-called law and order candidate. And we'll talk much more about that later in the course. There were many causes for the growing violence among blacks, some of which I've talked already about earlier in the course. In simplest terms, nonviolence hadn't worked for most of the northern urban black population. The civil rights movement to that point had concentrated on the South. And those northern, northern urban blacks confronted many problems, including housing discrimination and uh, poor and inadequate housing in general, job discrimination, segregated schools, unequal pay, racism in the streets, unfair law enforcement, and limited opportunities for advancement. Other strategies didn't seem to be working, and so rioting and chaos and violence seemed to be the only way to call adequate attention to their plight. The racial situation and growing violence and chaos in the cities drew great attention across the country. It was really one of the major things that people were talking about in 1967 and 1968 across the country. In 1967, Newsweek magazine published a large special issue reporting on the riots and uh, racial issues in the country. It drew a lot of attention to the problems. And although the magazine failed to uh, produce a reasonable solution to the problems, one of the things they proposed was uh, integrating certain suburbs, but only allowing a small number of blacks in each neighborhood so that whites living there wouldn't be threatened. And obviously, this is an inadequate kind of solution. But it did draw attention to the problem. And as the magazine wrote at that time, the problem is urgent as the exploding cities and the incendiary rhetoric make inescapably plain. A few months later, in March of 1968, the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, which was chaired by Governor Otto Kerner of Illinois, and sometimes simply called the Kerner Report, was released. Lyndon Johnson had created the Kerner Commission after the rioting of 1967 to look into the root causes of these kind of riots. Previous studies had always pointed the finger at the rioters themselves or protesters themselves or underprivileged classes, the impoverished in the cities who were creating uh, issues on their own. The Kerner Commission came to quite different conclusions than these previous reports. Bad policing policies, a flawed justice system, poor credit practices, inadequate housing, unemployment, voter suppression, police violence, inadequately trained uh, police and riot officers, and so on, all contributed to these issues. Fear was a major factor as well. In the midst of these kind of clashes, fear on both sides contributed to the outbreak of violence. In Detroit, the report said, the city at this time was saturated with fear. The National Guardsmen were afraid, the citizens were afraid, and the police were afraid. White society, the report wrote, is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. In its most famous and memorable phrase, the report stated, Our nation is moving towards two societies, one white, one black, separate and unequal. This was a shocking report coming some 15 years into the civil rights movement, 15 years or so after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, and 13 or 14 years after the Montgomery bus boycotts and Rosa Parks. Most of American society, and certainly white American society, wanted to believe that we were making great progress, that the civil rights movement itself was becoming unnecessary because we were solving racial problems. The Kerner Commission report seemed to make it find that the civil rights movement had accomplished nothing to this point and that problems were still rife throughout American society. For his part, Lyndon Johnson wasn't particularly happy with the report either. He had hoped that the commission would find that some of his actions 
had been helping the situation. Lyndon Johnson had pointed the finger at outside communist agitators at times, and the report challenged that assertion. It also overturned the thought that one of the responsible parties in a number of the riots and clashes were journalists themselves who were inflaming passion. What was the solution? Well, while there were no easy and simple solutions to problems like this, massive government spending to try to establish a sense of equality between the races was at least one possible solution. The report pointed out that uh, a solution that would not be effective was simply arming more officers and sending more of an armed presence into the troubled areas. This was only sure to spark further violence. The published report became one of the best-selling books of that year, selling more than 700,000 copies in just a few weeks. Americans all across the country read the report or heard uh, news reporting about it. There was considerable white backlash against the report. Again, most white Americans wanted to think that we had made racial progress in the country, that they had done enough, and certainly that uh, white society itself was not to blame for many of these problems. In fact, this underlying kind of back current against the Kerner Report and many of its findings contributed to the law and order aspect of Richard Nixon's presidential campaign and ultimately contributed to uh, a backlash that resorted to the old tactic of sending more armed officers into troubled areas and only furthered much of the violence that was happening. In the midst of this study, we see the Orangeburg massacre occur, which actually points to many of the findings that the Kerner Commission discovered. It is in this atmosphere that Martin Luther King begins launching what would turn out to be the final campaign of his life, which he called the Poor People's Campaign, that would ultimately lead him to Memphis, Tennessee, and his ultimate demise.